Well, by now we've all heard the sad news about the passing of Roger Ebert, sort of the daddy of us all. Yes. Uh, every person who likes to talk about movies has certainly been informed and influenced by the work of uh, Mr. Ebert. Yes, he uh, was happily inescapable. He loved Madison and visited Madison uh, quite often, and I had the great honor of introducing him at a Q&A. Oh, the one time I ever met him, he was very friendly, very affable, and it's and he was obviously listening to what me and all my friends were saying when we talked to him. He's a good dude, and we're honored to carry on his legacy in our own small way on this show. So, uh, goodbye, Roger. We will see you at the movies, in the balcony, in the front row, the back row, any theater we go into to watch a film, we will see you and remember you. If you're not there... We'll ask for our money back. <laughs> I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. You're making weird lip movements at me. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Craig, who's the actor that we like so much and can't seem to stop talking about? Michael Shannon. That's right. Spooky-eyed actor extraordinaire, Michael Shannon. We're such big fans. He's in our Hall of Fame. We've got to eventually watch one of his movies, right? This is the day you've been waiting for. Awesome. But first, a little bit of biographical information about Mr. Shannon. He is the grandson of famous entomologist Raymond Corbett Shannon. My favorite entomologist. Stop it. Who made his name studying malaria-spreading mosquitoes in Brazil in the 20s. How appropriate that young Michael would originate the role of Peter Evans in Tracy Letts' play Bug at the Steppenwolf Theatre Company and on the big screen. Michael Shannon is also in a band. <laughs> is he? And he <laughs> sings. Really? Yes. The band is called Corporal. Their self-titled debut album features songs with titles such as Sick, Cat in a Closet, and Let Me Eat It. Cat in the Closet. Let me eat it. Sick. Boom, You're boom, right. boom. Very good. I think I showed my range there. You must be a great at magnetic poetry. <laughs> Just a few of Mr. Shannon's charms are his scary intensity and his ability to make craziness understated and subtle. I get the feeling we're going to be seeing all of that in tonight's movie, along with a big heapin' helpin' of Herzog. Tonight's movie is My Son, My Son, What Have Ye Done? I don't know what this is. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! Shandango. Hold it up. Hold it up in front of your face. Oh, there you go. That's scary. Shandango. Shandango. <laughs> yeah. This, we will be having a Shandango tonight. <laughs> Released in 2009, directed by Werner Herzog, and produced by David Lynch, the project grew out of a meeting between the two filmmakers in 2000, where they both expressed a desire for, in Herzog's words, a return to essential filmmaking with small budgets, good stories, and the best actors available. The film features our favorite Kinski surrogate, Udo Kier. Sitting on the bullets. Sinking of power. <laughs> and nice. actress Grace Zabriskie, both of whom were in My Own Private Idaho, which this we is just true. watched. Grace loves to be in movies with my in the title. <laughs> you can also see her in the television show My Twin Peaks. Yes. Every episode you get a gift from me, and I'm afraid that tonight's gift I can only give you on one condition. Yes, and what would that be? That it remain, for the time being, here in the basement. Okay. When we have our inevitable falling out, you can take it home with you. <laughs> but for now, I would like it to stay here. Well, all right. Excellent. Okay? Now, close your eyes, and don't open them until I tell you. All right. All right. Open your eyes. Ah, oh, it's a, a signed picture of, of Michael Shannon himself. We can constantly have the disapproving eyes of Michael <laughs> Shannon watching us. <laughs> That's good. My son, my son, would you like to watch a movie? Come on over with us to the old leather couch for Werner Herzog and David Lynch's My Son, My Son, What Have Ye Done? It's a mouthful. That title's got a lot of commas. My son, my son, the title's too long. 
Detective Havenhurst and Detective Vargas are driving around town talking about being cops. They get a call to investigate a crime. Somebody's dead. And outside of the scene of the crime, they see a strange, muttering man, played by our good friend Michael Shannon. Razzle them. Dazzle them. Razzle, dazzle them. Excuse me. They go into the house and see that a murder has happened with a sword. Turns out the muttering man, Brad McCallum, is the prime suspect in the murder. And now he's inside his house, and he's got a gun, and he claims to have two hostages. Detective Havenhurst tries to negotiate with Brad. He rolls out a canister of oats from the garage. He's gonna kill us with carbs. So the police surround the house, and the movie becomes surrounded by flashbacks. We get a little bit of Brad's trip down to Peru. You don't kayak during the rainy season. Nobody. Nobody does it. Worst vaudeville sketch ever. <laughs> All his friends on the kayaking trip drowned. He came from back from that trip a little bit crazy. Arriving on the scene is Brad's fiance. I don't mean to alarm you, Miss Goodmanson. But oh! Uh! <laughs> She's getting engaged to him for some reason, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with love, chemistry, or any sort of affection. So what? She seems to enjoy being trapped in horribly awkward conversations. Wouldn't it be nice to live on the moon? In the bedroom. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> David Lynch had a hand in that scene, <laughs> I know it! Brad tells Ingrid, I've seen him. I've seen God. He shows her the face of God. This is God. This is what he looks like. Brad. Leave God alone for the night. He stabbed his mother. Turns out the murder victim is Brad's mother. I remember this dinner we had the other night. Sure, it was full of tense grimacing, but it was a <laughs> nice dinner. Things are all thrown apart by the fact that Jello has arrived. But Brad, you love Jello. And here's a year's supply of it. Eat it now. I'd like to order a pizza! A pizza man shows up with a pizza delivery for Brad. Gonna... Detective Vargas, like he's never been near any sort of scary situation before in his life, brings the pizza up to the house, and he's freaked out by the situation. I have your pizza! Can you see my gun? This one's for eating, this one's for fun. Send it! Send it right here! Okay. <laughs> Brad was also an actor in a play. An ancient Greek play in which Orestes kills his mother, Clytemnestra. Creatures that fly, and creatures that crawl, and things more horrid still, like the cradle of storms. This play already is less weird than this movie. <laughs> And who should show up to the scene of the hostage negotiation but Lee Myers, Brad's director. Of course, Brad was weird during play rehearsal, too, insisting on having a real sharp sword. A sword that he got from his weird Uncle Ted, who owns an ostrich farm where they breed giant chickens. Ted is a little bit of a kook. He's an old man who's set in his ways, and he knows about theater folk. Only faggots. And Negroes with attitude become actors. I, I didn't know he was an NWA fan. <laughs> well, the only thing that Greeks know how to play with is each other's balls. And Ionic and Doric columns. It's a Greek play. Is, is he Greek? Is, is, is he constantly getting into disputes over Cyprus? Because I hate that. We hear more from Lee Myers about Brad's erratic behavior. That he had to kick him out of the play. He causes a big scene. Draw him sword in hand, I loved her head! If only there was some sort of sign that something was wrong with Brad. We could have stopped this needless tragedy. Why is the whole world staring at me? Because you act crazy every second of every day. Why are the mountains staring at me? One <laughs> Brad is obviously cuckoo crazy. The SWAT team just showed up. There's going to be no escape for Brad. Team three, get to that garage. Team four, go long perimeter. Beware of random non sequiturs. <laughs> Subject is a little confusing. Nothing's going to happen to you, but you have to come out, Brad. 
Bring that perfect Serbian Nazum out of the house. The cops interview the eyewitnesses of the murder and they find out what really happened in the house. Mother informs the neighbors that he tried to smother her last night with a pillow. Kill me before it happens. Kill me. What are you... Kill me! Brad finally surrenders himself. Turns out the two hostages are his pet flamingos. My eagles and drag. Eagles and drag would be the Donna Henleys. And as he's being led to the squad car, he has two things to put on the official police record. One, forget about flamingos, I see ostriches. Herzog moment. He wanted them to report that he had ostriches hostages. And two, whatever happened to my basketball? David Lynch moment. <laughs> That is the hows and the whys of why Brad done what he done, like a very bad son. My son, my son, what have ye done? I think that's what Herzog said to himself after viewing the finished movie. <laughs> it went off the rails and it just kept going. It, it forgot what rails were. It came back to the rails and the rails had turned into balloons. Yeah. And, you know. It was a mess. It was. It was a goddamn mess. <laughs> well, it wasn't without its charms. It definitely had charms and it had style, but that's just about all that it had. Like, weirdness works, mm -hmm. but all the weirdness in this was just completely apropos of nothing, it seemed. They would do these, these live-action tableaus, seemingly for no reason. Now, we just watched My Own Private Idaho, which did the exact same thing, but those were very successful because it was clear why, why they were doing that. You know, lovemaking is an art. You could also say that it's functional because you get to see a whole lot more of the love of the lovemaking mm -hmm. if you're only seeing like eight specific moments in it. In this, they're having dinner and suddenly they all just are still. And it's unclear why. I don't think that movies necessarily have to communicate with the viewer. We're doing this for this reason, and you should know why that reason is happening, because we're a good movie. But for a movie that has, like, no footing, and it's just totally off in space the whole time, it just becomes, uh, just like, uh, uh, well, is it I, over yet? I wonder how much of an influence David Lynch had in, in the creative aspects of this movie, because it seems to me it's these two guys really collaborating on a movie, and it really doesn't work very well. You, you have two things that taste great. It's like, I love double-stuffed Oreos, and I love chicken. And it's like, just mash them all together. <laughs> David Lynch, I think it would be fun to make a movie for you, and we both like police procedures. Do you have any ideas? Yes, kayaking. Yeah, In a, Peru. I must have an ostrich devour a pair of glasses. There has to be a policeman offering someone coffee. This is what uh, Herzog had to say about the film. No. He wanted it to be, quote, a horror film without the blood, chainsaws, and gore, but with a strange anonymous fear creeping up in you, unquote. Do you think he succeeded? I know what the strange anonymous fear was. It's not anonymous anymore because we gave a name to it. It's a puppy swill panic. <laughs> It usually happens right in the middle of the movie. But like smack in the middle. Okay, what was your question? A, do you think he made a horror film? No. Do you think it was suspenseful? No, it's... Okay, I think he thinks it's a horror movie because we're watching a man deteriorate. It's about a bunch of people knowing that it's going to end with this tragedy. That doesn't really hold up as far as horror go. If you compare it to Bogdanovich's targets from like 1969 or 70 where the first half of the movie is basically this guy getting ready to go on a rampage. That is very tense, and it's a horror movie, even though no one's dying quite yet. Right, right. And I didn't get that feeling at all from here. This movie reminded me a lot of The Happening. Have you seen that? No, I haven't, because I read reviews. Very similar. Characters who sort of are oblivious to the ridiculousness of everything that's happening around them. And in other Herzog movies, there's unrealistic dialogue, but it works within the style of the movie. But in this, it's just, it's a sound of sinking. Herzog wanted a return to essential filmmaking. Now, what do you think essential filmmaking means? Essential filmmaking is basically storytelling. I think essential filmmaking means, like, making a movie that, that matters. And he doesn't succeed in either of these. I would like to know what Herzog's definition of essential is. I'll look it up. Look it up. He's talked about that ecstatic <clears throat> truth idea. Mm. Maybe essential filmmaking is another one of his ideas. 
Okay, well, here's a quote. <clears throat> when you're into filmmaking, you have to have your finger on the pulse of real life, of real, raw, essential life. No. <laughs> Part of real life is how people talk, and this movie didn't have that. Every actor had, like, a heaviness about them, because they just, like, were struggling through these script pages. Michael Shannon did as good as he could out of bad material. I, I kind of disagree with you. I felt like his... A lot of his performance was a little flat. Now, this movie was actually postponed because Herzog needed to work on Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans with Nicolas Cage. Yes. A real-life crazy person. (laughs) Now, this movie shared a lot of similarities with that movie. Lots of very hallucinatory images, characters doing strange strange things out of nowhere. But in that, that movie had a context for that because it was about this crazy crack-smoking detective. So, of course, he's going to hallucinate. You didn't get that sense of context in this movie. This movie just seemed like a big box of stuff that is just thrown up on the screen. And here you go. Here you go, audience. Big (laughs) box of stuff. There's a, oh, I found a basketball in here. I found, oh, there's a a little flamingo. There there you go. Throw that in there, too. Why not? I want to see this exact same movie redone either just by Werner Herzog or just by David Lynch. But, of course, we don't know... How much of a hand Lynch had in the script writing or the story. When you watch Pulp Fiction, you don't think, I wonder how much Danny DeVito had to do with this movie. (laughs) (laughs) What have we done? We've watched My Son, My Son, What Have Ye Done. Don't trust our judgment, though. You should check it out and see what you think. You might see something that we didn't catch a glimpse of essential filmmaking that we're missing. By all means, go out and watch no. My Son, My Son, What Have Ye Done. I can't allow this to happen. Don't see this movie. Please, won't you go visit WelcomeToTheBasementShow.com. There's all kinds of things for you to read and do. And there's also the donation button. You can donate to support the show. It just only takes a few dollars. And uh, you help support independent filmmaking. Our recent donors are Robert, Patrick, Oliver, Jan, and Boudouin. Also, happy birthday to Laura Erickson, who had just had a birthday on April 6th. Got a couple comments about Craig here. I always Uh-oh. like to read these. Gabrielle B74, Craig is totally kissable. Really? I've always known that, Gabrielle. That's why I, I, I always invite him to the couch, but he never lets me. Femi Nerd 225 I've figured out who I keep thinking Craig looks like. Vincent Van Dort from Corpse Bride. Let me, let me <laughs> take a look. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> 2057 AJDJ Hey guys, great show. I'm a big fan and couldn't help but notice that your next episode comes out on my 18th birthday. So I was wondering if you had any good life slash movie advice that you can share with the next generation of movie lover. Think about the type of movie that you know the least about and then go watch a bunch of movies of that type. Exposing yourself to as many different kinds of movies as you can will deepen your appreciation of the ones that you do enjoy. You only have so much time in this life to watch movies. Don't see the client. (laughs) It's boring. (laughs) That's all the customer comments we have, and now it's time for... Seen it. Mr. Hassenpfeffer says, Have you guys seen Murder by Death? Great movie. It might be my favorite title of all time. I'm not a Frenchie. I'm a Belgie. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> My favorite quote from that movie. The Foot of Gold. Have you seen Steve Martin is the jerk? I saw it when I was about 13 and thought it was the best thing ever made. Seen it. Seen it. I grew up watching the jerk on television, so the dog's name was Stupid. I caught it on cable where I knew the dog's actual name. I don't know if I've talked about it on this show, but uh, Steve Martin really was a comic genius. You look at the stand-up he was doing in that era, nobody was doing anything that was close to that. The way he lampooned, like, 70s culture and celebrity, and it was just, it was genius. It really was. And also as a physical comedian, things Mm -hmm. he would do in The Jerk all all the way up through the end of the 80s. He was so good with his body. Vinny DeQ, just wondering if you've seen the underrated Steve Martin film, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. Absolutely amazing blend of classic film and modern black and white footage. Seen it. Seen it. That was the second pairing of Steve Martin and Carl Reiner. The first being the jerk. My favorite scene in that is when he's doing kind of the parody of the uh, of all the gin joints in all the world. He's sort of the drunken Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. But he just says, shit on her. <laughs> Carl Peterson, greetings from Sweden. 
Here's a suggestion for what I assume would be in the Seen It segment. The Shining. Mostly, I would just like to hear your opinions on what I consider Kubrick's magnum opus. Oh, I saw that when I was far, far too young to see the movie. I think I did, too. It's probably the scariest movie I've ever seen. Um, we talk about David Cronenberg and we talk about body horror. Mm-hmm. I think The Shining is like soul horror. Yeah. And the, the horror in that movie is so deep and it gets so deep inside your bones that you just can't shake it for days after seeing it. The problem with the movie, and I don't blame him for it, is Nicholson's performance. He is playing every scene of that movie from the very beginning like he's looking for a reason to kill his entire family. I don't blame him. I blame Kubrick for doing 80 takes. But... The sense of dread that happens right from the very beginning, mm-hmm. that's effective. Oh, every moment of the movie is scary. It's, yeah. I'm not saying anything else against the movie except that one thing. I watch scary movies too young, and I think I, I, think I have some psychological damage. <laughs> I watch them too young, too, and I don't care at all. Keenan Little. Have you guys seen District 9? District 9 is one of my favorite movies. The story is emotional, action, and sci-fi all in one great movie. If you have not seen it, see it. Oh, and I love this show. Seen it. Seen it. And I love this show, too. (laughs) Here's another example of what we've been talking about for the past couple episodes. The Redeemable Asshole. The main character in this movie is a terrible guy. Horrible. He murders uh, babies and (laughs) laughs about it. By the end of the movie, you know, obviously he's put through so much. Maybe that's the secret of the redeemable asshole. If you physically and or mentally torture them enough, they become redeemable. They have to have some sort of punishment right, for redemption. Green Gables Girl. As romantic films go, one of my favorites is Kenneth Branagh's adaptation of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing. Seen it? I've seen it. And Craig and I were both in the play together. <laughs> yes, we were. I played the Keanu Reeves role, if you can believe that shit. <laughs> I played the Kenneth Branagh role. One thing you may not know about Craig Johnson, which I found out by doing that play, is that he's quite the dancer. And then you had that scene where you had to jump behind the bush. That's the only thing people talk to me about. Wow. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, you jump behind the bush in that one scene. I'm like, how did I do with the Shakespeare? It was thanks. a, it no, was no, a no, good no, no, jump. Thanks, thanks. It, it was, was a, a good it jump. It was a really good jump, yes. Anyway, we probably should talk about the movie. <laughs> yeah, we probably should. <laughs> we were just blissful at the end of it the, yeah. the re- that positive release that comes with that movie that's seen it and that's our show we hope you enjoyed the surreal journey of what was the name of the movie again? my son my, my son, son my son what have you done go check out welcome to the basement show.com and you can see other shows of ours in the past yeah make a donation if you see fit we sure enjoyed spending this time with you and we will see you again next time Until then, the basement is beneath the rest of the house. Uncle Ted also has an idea for a TV commercial involving a very large rooster and a very tiny man. Commercial for what? Get out. (laughs) What's what's happening? David Lynch presents the new Land's End catalog. Why is the whole world 